This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 7. Coming up on Space Time. 7 billion year old stardust discovered in a meteorite. NASA's farewell to an old friend. And it looks like space junk has destroyed a Russian spy satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists studying the famous Murchison meteorite, which fell to Earth in Victoria in 1969, have discovered 7 billion-year-old pre-solar grains, the oldest material ever found on Earth. The study's lead author, Associate Professor Philip Heck from the University of Chicago's Field Museum, says they're the oldest solid materials ever found and will tell science about how stars formed in our galaxy. The tiny grains Heck and colleagues found are called pre-solar grains, minerals that formed before the sun was born. Heck describes them as solid samples of stars, bits of real stardust that became trapped in meteors, where they remained unchanged for billions of years, making them, quite literally, time capsules from before our solar system was born. Stars are born when molecular clouds of gas and dust are caused to collapse, heat up and eventually trigger nuclear fusion. They'll then burn for millions to billions of years until eventually running out of fuel and dying. During their lives and when they die, stars generate powerful stellar wind streaming out of them and carrying away a plasma of ionized particles, atoms and molecules. When they cool down enough, some of these gases will condense to form solid grains of material, which will end up forming new stars, or planets, or moons, or asteroids. And a meteorite from one of these asteroids fell to Earth just over 50 years ago, breaking apart in the atmosphere and raining down just south of the sleepy rural town of Murchison, 167 kilometres north of Melbourne. The meteorite samples collected from that event became the subject of intense scientific investigation, including the first ever detection of extraterrestrial amino acids, the very building blocks of life. In fact, the Murchison meteorite samples contained some 90 different amino acids, only 19 of which are found on Earth. It also contained the oldest materials ever known to have reached Earth, but no one knew exactly how old they really were, until now. Pre-solar grains are hard to come by. They're rare, found in only about 5% of meteorites that have fallen to Earth, and they're microscopically tiny. The Field Museum's collection of Murchison meteorite pre-solar grains were identified about 30 years ago. Scientists crushed fragments of the meteorite into a powder, which was then dissolved in an acid, leaving only the pre-solar grains. Now, once the pre-solar grains were isolated, scientists could try and determine what sort of stars they came from by measuring their exposure to high-energy cosmic rays. You see, the cosmic grains will interact with atoms and molecules in these grains, forming new elements, and the longer they're exposed, the more of these elements are formed. By measuring how many of these new cosmic ray-produced elements are present in a pre-solar grain, scientists can tell roughly how long it's been exposed to cosmic rays, which in turn tell scientists how old it is. The minerals reported in the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences were found to be between 4.6 and 4.9 billion years old, meaning they're at least as old, and many much older, than the 4.6 billion year age of the Earth's Sun and Solar System. But some of these grains were found to be much older than that, some more than five and a half billion years old. And the age of the pre-solar grains wasn't the end of the discovery. Since pre-solar grains are formed when stars die, they can tell us about the history of those stars. And it seems seven billion years ago there was an apparently bumper crop of new stars forming a sort of astral baby boom. In other words, the authors found far more young grains in this age group than expected. Heck says these grains are providing direct evidence for what must have been a period of enhanced star formation, starburst in our Milky Way, 7 billion years ago. And it doesn't end there. Judging by the way the minerals in these grains interacted with the cosmic rays, scientists could also determine that these pre-solar grains often floated through space stuck together in large clusters, something no one thought was possible on such a scale. All in all, it's been an incredible revelation, all thanks to a meteorite which fell in country Victoria. 
You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, NASA says farewell to an old friend. And later in the science report, Australia's devastating bushfires were made drastically worse because of man-made climate change. All that and more coming up on Space Time. NASA is saying goodbye to an old friend. One of the agency's four great observatories, the legendary Spitzer Space Telescope, is being retired. It was launched aboard a Delta II rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in August 2003 on what was meant to be a five-year mission. Spitzer studied the cosmos at infrared wavelengths, capturing spectacular groundbreaking science, including new images of galaxies, glowing gas nebulae, the composition of infant planets orbiting distant stars, and even the discovery of a new ring around Saturn. Spitzer was able to capture light from galaxies in the very early epoch of the universe, the light having been stretched due to the expansion of space-time over the eons from the bright ultraviolet to the infrared. And in 2005, Spitzer became the first telescope to directly see an exoplanet, picking up the light from HD 209458b. See, prior to this, all exoplanets were only detected indirectly, either by the wobble they caused to their host star as they orbited, or by transiting in front of the host star and blocking out some of its light. But as the years went on, Spitzer's instruments began slowly succumbing to the harsh environment of space. The biggest problem was keeping things cool. You see, infrared telescopes work by looking for heat being given off by objects, so their equipment needs to be kept colder than the space around them and what they're focusing on. To do that, they use a supply of liquid helium coolant in order to keep their instruments as cold as possible. But the supply isn't everlasting, and Spitzer's coolant eventually ran out in 2009, forcing NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to operate the space telescope in a so-called warm mode, limiting its operations with only two of the original four light wavelength windows available on its remaining instrument. Also, the 950 kilogram probe was placed into a heliocentric rather than geocentric orbit, trailing and gradually drifting away from Earth's orbit at approximately 0.1 astronomical units per year an astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, approximately 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. So now, after all this time in space, Spitzer is some 600 times further away from the Earth than the Moon is. And that's led to a geometric mismatch between its solar and communications arrays, meaning it can't transmit data to Earth and charge its solar panels at the same time. And to make matters worse, its batteries have also reached the end of their useful life. Spitzer was part of NASA's Great Earth Orbiting Space Observatories project, together with the Hubble Space Telescope, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, and the Chandra X-ray Telescope. Now it's the end of the road for Spitzer. It'll be switched off on January the 30th, marking the end of a mission that has quite literally seen the universe through a new light. This report from NASA TV. Three, two, one. We have ignition. Rocket launches. Um, it's thrusting out flames, and you're just watching, and you have all those emotions. And the rocket goes along on this journey, and it deploys Spitzer. The Spitzer Space Telescope is a member of NASA's family of great observatories. Spitzer is the infrared member of this family. Spitzer has unveiled the infrared universe. It has enabled humans to see what our eyes could not see. We see a whole new side to the universe that's hidden from us normally. You can peer inside of clouds of dust to see the baby stars called protostars being born. It let us see into more distant galaxies and see how the patterns of dust tell us about the motions of gas and the dynamics of gravity that operate in these objects. All of a sudden, we could create these vast panoramas at incredibly sharp resolutions that we'd never been able to do before. And as a result, everything that was familiar in the sky, every nebula that we're used to seeing in visible light images from the ground, things from Hubble, they became completely different when seen through the infrared eyes of Spitzer. It was this combination of a, a scientific insight that itself was just stunningly beautiful at the same time. 
The biggest surprise in terms of what was revealed with Spitzer is its ability to characterize exoplanets, so planets around other stars. Most notably, we identified a system called TRAPPIST-1, which has seven Earth-sized planets sort of snuggling up to what's a very cool star. And of those planets, three of them at least are in the habitable zone. When Spitzer launched, exoplanet science was absolutely not part of the science portfolio we were offering for Spitzer because it wasn't considered to be sensitive enough to do that kind of observations. But while in flight, Astronomers became clever about how they could use it. Engineers became very clever about how we could repurpose Spitzer. And exoplanet science has actually become one of the core science projects of Spitzer since then. The Google Doodle that day, which was Trappist-1, is what kind of finished me off on a glorious day. When your adult children point out that, you know, my mom works on that telescope, you know, that's, that's very rewarding. Spitzer Space Telescope is a technological marvel. I never had any conception that we'd be going for 16 years. The little machine that could go beyond its primary design. The longevity of the mission is a direct result of the engineers and scientists and people that have supported the mission. In a place that dares mighty things, you can do it together. And so when you have that kind of union, I think what happens is magic. I'm hoping Spitzer will be remembered as a really amazing uh, scientific gift and that it allowed us to kind of transform our understanding of some very important aspects of astronomy. And I think Spitzer's been integral to all that. We have a huge archive that is waiting to be mined, and its, its revelations already have been tremendous and revolutionary, that only time will tell what is Spitzer's greatest legacy. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Spitzer Space Telescope Project Manager Joseph Hunt from NASA JPL, Spitzer Project Scientists Mike Werner and Fariza Morales, Spitzer Space Center Visualization Scientist Robert Hurt, former Spitzer Project Manager Lisa Story Lombardi, Spitzer Space Telescope Systems Manager Bo Carr, and Spitzer Space Center Manager Sean Carey. You're listening to Space Time, still to come. A Russian spy satellite breaks up in orbit. Has it been hit by a piece of space junk? And the Great Melbourne Telescope back on public display, just in time for celebrations, marking its 150th anniversary. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A top-secret Russian spy satellite has broken apart in orbit. The United States Space Command says Moscow's Cosmos 2491 military satellite suddenly made a one and a half metre per second orbital change, then broke apart into at least 10 fragments, flying at altitudes between 1,329 and 1,699 kilometres above the planet's surface. There's speculation the satellite either exploded due to some sort of catastrophic failure on board, or far more likely, it collided with a piece of space junk. The Cosmos 2491 was launched together with three military communications satellites by Russian space forces back in December 2013 and remained operational for about a year. It was part of an anti-satellite warfare project by Moscow to develop spacecraft capable of manoeuvring and secretly inspecting other satellites while in orbit. That project's still going on, with numerous similar spacecraft launched since Cosmos 2491, including Cosmos 2499, Cosmos 2504, and Cosmos 2519. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, a major milestone for Virgin Galactic's next spaceship, and Moscow's new avant-garde hypersonic glide nuclear missile into service. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The Great Melbourne Telescope's gone on public display as part of celebrations marking its 150th anniversary. This icon of Australian colonial astronomy has now been reassembled into its original form for the first time since 1945. Museums Victoria staff and volunteers have been working to restore the historic instrument at the pumping station at ScienceWorks in Melbourne since 2008. The telescope was originally built in 1869 for use at the Melbourne Observatory 
next to the Royal Botanic Gardens. At the time, it was the second biggest telescope in the world and the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, and it quickly became a Melbourne icon, symbolising the city's wealth and scientific status. But after the Melbourne Observatory closed in 1944, the telescope was sold and relocated to the Mount Stromlo Observatory near Canberra, where it was modified by the Australian National University for a role in modern astronomy. In the 1990s, it was converted into Australia's first fully robotic and computerised digital imaging telescope, and was used to find the first observational evidence of dark matter. Dark matter is, of course, one of the biggest mysteries in science today. Put simply, scientists have no idea what it is, even though it makes up some 85% of all the matter in the universe. It seems to be invisible, and it interacts only gravitationally with normal matter. The stuff stars, planets, asteroids, houses, cars, trees, dogs, cats, and people are made out of. Astronomers only know dark matter exists because they can see its gravitational effect on normal matter, such as preventing galaxies from flying apart as they rotate. Then in 2003, the Canberra bushfires raged through the Mount Stromlo Observatory, destroying much of the facility, but leaving the original heavy cast iron backbone of the old telescope relatively unscathed. In 2008, the remains of the telescope were recovered by staff and volunteers from Museums Victoria and brought back to Melbourne for restoration. The Victorian government committed $600,000 towards the $2.1 million project, and that allowed the team to complete the first stage of the restoration, which has now seen the telescope return to what was its original physical configuration. Dr Nick Lom, consultant curator of astronomy with the Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory, says the eventual aim of the project is to restore the telescope to full operating condition so that future generations can peer through its giant eyepieces and be awe-inspired by the magnificent wonders of the heavens above. That is one of the most important scientific artefacts or scientific objects in the country. If the telescope was when it was uh, first used was the largest viewable telescope in the world. It had mirror 1.2 meters in diameter, or what then called 48 inches in diameter, so it could see very faint objects. It was installed at Melbourne Observatory, which was a very unusual thing to do. Most large telescopes in those days were the province of amateur astronomers or wealthy amateur astronomers. Professional astronomical observatories did was to make very accurate measurements of positions of stars in the sky and observe things like comets and eclipses of the sun, take very accurate observations. So large telescopes were very unusual for a major professional observatory. So the Victoria colonial government obtained this telescope in the 1860s and uh, showed a lot of foresight. Unfortunately, the telescope was a little bit too early. It had just missed the boat in many ways. One of the things was it had a metal mirror, a kind of metal mirror. This was the way large telescopes, so relatively large uh, telescopes were built in those days with metal mirrors. But the idea of glass mirrors silver coated or later on aluminum, aluminum coated was only just coming into fashion and the committee of elderly astronomers in Britain who actually were responsible for the design of telescope thought oh that's that's too new it's too risky so they had it built with a metal mirror and that created all sorts of problems including making the telescope very massive. The other problem that, that if the telescope was, wasn't quite suitable for was photography. So it missed the boat for photography because photography was a few years later was coming into it, its own that people started observing the sky and taking photographs of the sky, which is a great improvement observing the sky. But so this telescope, the Great Melbourne Telescope, was designed just to look through and to map and to do drawings of nebulae, these fuzzy objects in the sky. And this it did very well, but it, it missed out on being able to take photographs of the sky. At least uh, it wasn't really fully equipped to take photographs. It did take one or two photographs of the moon, which actually were very uh, highly publicised at the time, and people were, uh, you know, were very impressed with those photographs of the moon. But generally, it did not take photographs. It was designed just to look through by eye and do drawings. The telescope was installed here at Melbourne in 1869. It had an observer was sent out with it from Britain, a young mathematician called Albert Lesseur. 
and he used the telescope. He tried to set up the telescope for uh, about a year. He had various problems, one of them being removing the protective coating of the mirror. The, mirror, the two mirrors, metal mirrors were sent out for the telescope. He had problems with that. He had problems setting it up. He had problems knowing who he was responsible to, whether he was responsible to director of Melbourne Observatory, Robert Ellery, or the Royal Society back in England, who had basically designed the telescope and uh, employed him. So he got that very upset after a while. He didn't feel he was being paid enough and he resigned after 12 months. The telescope was continued to be used for a few years at the observatory but after a while it was not really used and then the Melbourne observatory was closed down in 1944. The telescope was sold to the Mount Stromlo Observatory in Canberra and was taken to Mount Stromlo and it was reworked into a modern telescope which worked for a few years and then after a while it was re reworked into an even more modern telescope which is a telescope, automated telescope designed to look for machos. Machos being massive astrophysical compact halo objects. Machos were considered one of the possible candidates for dark matter. That's correct but in the end, the, the, telescope, the telescope worked very well, but didn't find many machos. So uh, it is not, they're not really a major component of dark matter. I should say that it was looking for dark matter, but the acronym was named in contrast to WIMPs, W-I-M-P, Weekly Interactive Massive Particles. And these are uh, still a major candidate for dark matter. And so the idea was that they could look for much larger objects which could be part of dark matter. Now, unfortunately, there was a fire in the Observatory in 2003, January 2003, and basically all the telescopes that uh, we had on Monstromlo in Canberra were destroyed in the fire, including the Great Northern Telescope. And so all the modern parts were destroyed, but the metal parts survived. And these were eventually brought back to Melbourne by the Museums Victoria. And for the last 10 years or so, they've been worked on by a group of volunteers who've been working very hard in cleaning the metal parts of the telescope, actually working out what went where. There's no original diagram of what the telescope originally looked like. There are photographs, but there's no detailed drawings. So they have to go by the photographs and try to work out what the telescope originally looked like. Like um, what parts are missing. There are quite a few parts that are missing and they have to be designed and built. And the telescope has now been reassembled for the first time since the Stromer fire in 2003 and apparently looks very impressive. People are still working on it and the plan is that when it's completed it will be uh, automated, it will be an automatic telescope and it will be rehoused where it was housed originally in the grounds of Melbourne Observatory in a building with a giant slide of roof. When I've seen it uh, some time ago, it's fairly decrepit condition, but the original sliding roof was still there, but was no longer sliding. So that building will have to be sort of restored. And then when the telescope is completely rebuilt, the plan is that it will be housed in that building and will be available for public viewings. And it will become a major tourist attraction in Melbourne when it's completed. That's Dr Nick Lom, consultant curator of astronomy with the Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Virgin Galactic's next commercial spaceship has reached its weight on wheels milestone, in which all the major structural elements and components of the vehicle are assembled and the spacecraft is sitting on the ground on its landing gear for the first time. The weight on wheels construction milestone was reached much quicker than either of Virgin Galactic's two previous spacecraft, the VSS Enterprise, which was destroyed in 2014 during a fatal mid-flight breakup, and the VSS Unity, which is the company's current test vehicle. Spacecraft assembly will now focus on final structural closeouts, as well as integrating flight control systems and avionics. It will then move to integrated verification ground tests, and eventually vehicle flight testing. Meanwhile, work on the fourth spacecraft, the third in the current fleet, is now more than 50% complete. And if tests with Unity continue to go as planned, the company expects to be carrying its first space tourist later this year. 
Virgin Galactic spacecraft design, collectively known as Spaceship 2, are based on the original Burt Rutad scale composite Spaceship 1 prototype, which won the X Prize in 2004 by becoming the first privately built reusable manned spacecraft to reach 100 kilometers in altitude and then repeat the achievement within two weeks. An altitude of 100 kilometers or 328,000 feet is the official start of space, known as the Kármán line. Defined by theoretical physicist Theodore von Kármán in 1956, it marks the point in altitude at which aerodynamic surfaces can no longer control the lift, roll, pitch or yaw of an aircraft, forcing them to use reaction systems such as rockets and jets to maintain course and manoeuvring. In other words, the aircraft is now spacecraft. Richard Branson was so impressed with Spaceship One, he signed a contract with Scale Composites to develop a fleet of similar though slightly bigger craft for space tourism. The idea being to allow paying passengers to experience a suborbital space flight to altitudes of over 100 kilometres, providing them with stunning views of the Earth's curvature down below and up to four minutes of microgravity. Once operational, the flights will include up to six space tourists at a time, each paying a quarter of a million dollars for the journey. The flight profile sees the space plane mounted under the center spar wing section of the White Knight 2 mothership, taking off horizontally on a conventional runway. The twin fuselage four-jet engine-powered White Knight 2 will climb to an altitude of around 15.5 kilometers or 50,000 feet, where it releases the spaceship 2, which drops briefly, then fires up its hybrid rocket engine for about 70 seconds, accelerating the spacecraft to some 4,000 kilometers per hour. That's over Mach 3. After 70 seconds, main engine cutout or MECO occurs, and the spacecraft continues to coast on a ballistic trajectory to an apex of around 110 kilometers or 361,000 feet. Passengers enjoy the beauty of space, a stunning view of the Earth beneath them, and the giddy feeling of microgravity. As the spacecraft re-enters the atmosphere, its twin tail booms are raised into a vertical or feathered position to increase drag, helping to slow its rate of descent. At a height of about 22.9 kilometers, or roughly 70,000 feet, the tail booms are de-feathered back into the horizontal configuration, allowing the spacecraft to once again become an aircraft and glide to a conventional runway landing. Virgin Galactic's development suffered a major setback in 2014, when VSS Unity's predecessor Enterprise broke apart mid-air, killing one of the test pilots after he released the feathering system during the ascent phase of the flight. You see, releasing the feathering system during ascent allowed it to lock in place, which put a huge aerodynamic load on the airframe, causing the spacecraft to break apart. It's not something Virgin want to talk about, which is why all the press releases refer to the Wait on Wheels milestone as being for their second spaceship rather than their third. China has launched a new experimental satellite into orbit. The TJSW-5 technology test satellite was launched aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province. The spacecraft will transmit radio, television and data communication services, as well as testing new high-throughput technology. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that Australia's devastating bushfires were made drastically worse because of man-made climate change. The findings confirm that global warming promotes the sorts of conditions on which wildfires depend, thereby increasing their likelihood and their level of ferociousness. A new study by scientists from the University of East Anglia, the Met Office Hadley Centre, the University of Exeter and Imperial College London are based on 57 studies published since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's fifth assessment report in 2013. All the studies have shown links between climate change and increased frequency or severity of fire weather, periods with a high fire risk due to a combination of high temperatures, low humidity, low rainfall and often high winds. According to the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, 2019 was the country's warmest and driest year on record. In fact, the observational data shows that fire weather seasons have lengthened across approximately 25% of the Earth's vegetated surface, resulting in a 20% increase in the average global length of the fire weather season. 
So far, the megafires have blackened more than 18 million hectares, killing more than a billion animals, including major populations of rare and endangered koalas, wallabies, kangaroos, bats, quokkas, possums, native mice, including the critically endangered kangaroo island dunnart, as well as rare lizards and frogs, and many threatened bird species, including ridge and honey eaters, glossy black cockatoos, western ground parrots, and eastern bristle birds. It's feared many species have been wiped out. And ecologist Chris Dickman says those losses don't include fish and insect species. In fact, critical bee populations, deliberately isolated from the chemicals, parasites and pathogens which have caused global bee colony collapse, have also been hit hard. Just as devastating, although often overlooked, rare and endangered plant species have also been wiped out in many parts of the country. Of course, as well as the disastrous environmental effects, the fires have killed at least 28 people, destroyed more than 2,000 homes, and wiped entire townships off the map. Smoke from Australia's fires has blanketed cities, including Sydney and Melbourne, dramatically affecting air quality and turning them into some of the most polluted places on the planet. As well as reducing oxygen intake, the poisons in the smoke cause significant health issues. In fact, at least two deaths have been blamed on breathing complications caused by the bushfire smoke. NASA satellite images have been tracking the smoke plume's progress as it circumnavigated the entire planet, first extending from Australia across the Pacific to New Zealand and then beyond to Chile and Argentina, before crossing the South Atlantic, Southern Africa and the Indian Ocean until finally reaching Australian shores again. A new study has found that the age at which women hit menopause can be affected by how often they have sex as they get older. A report in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science claims examinations of almost 3,000 women found those who had sex on a weekly basis were 25% less likely to be menopausal than those who had sex less than once a month. The findings suggest that the bodies of women who aren't sexually active divert energy away from ovulation so it can be used elsewhere, such as into helping look after existing children or grandchildren. Moscow's new avant-garde hypersonic glide nuclear missile has started to enter service with the Russian military. Russian strategic missile forces have confirmed that the 1st Avangard Armed Missile Regiment has been stationed at the Yazensky Missile Compound 1,200 kilometres southeast of Moscow. Avangard is based around a radically advanced scramjet engine design, which enables the system to deliver nuclear payloads at speeds of up to Mach 27 at some 33,000 kilometres an hour, while still being capable of manoeuvring in flight, making it essentially invulnerable to all existing anti-missile defence systems. Avangard is launched into orbit by either an R-36 or RS-28 Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. These missiles are designed to carry up to 10 multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles or MIRVs from where they separate and proceed to their individual targets. Military experts say the deployment of Avangard could be a game-changer in terms of the global balance of power. Paleontologists have discovered a new set of dinosaur fossils in Queensland's Winton Formation. The 95-million-year-old remains were uncovered close to where Australovenator wintonensis, one of Australia's most complete ever dinosaur finds, was made. A report in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science claims the new fossils include two partial vertebrae, three bones from the hands and feet, and several other as yet unidentified bone fragments. Paleontologists believe it's a theropod, the same group as Australovenator and Tyrannosaurus rex. Family dogs never cease to surprise by just how well they understand human voices and gestures. But is this innate, or does it come through training? In an attempt to find out, scientists studied homeless dogs across several Indian cities, offering two covered bowls and pointing to only one of them. About half the dogs didn't even bother approaching the bowls. Researchers said that's because the dogs appeared to be particularly anxious, probably because they had bad encounters with humans in the past. But of the dogs that did investigate the bowls, about 80% correctly followed the human signal, suggesting training isn't required to understand such gestures. You can read the study in full in the journal Frontiers of Psychology. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 